The following is a production of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Sponsored by Colonel Illinois Jennifer N. Pritzker, Illinois National Guard, retired. Bringing citizens and citizen soldiers together through the exploration of military history, topics, and current affairs. This is Pritzker Military Presents. Welcome to a special episode of Pritzker Military Presents with British historian Sir Michael Howard, a recipient of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's 2015 Founders Literature Award, interviewed by Sir Max Hastings. I'm your host, Ken Clark, and this program was filmed at Howard's home near London and features a discussion of Howard's life and career, along with a variety of subjects ranging from World War II to the present. Sir Michael Howard has been called Britain's finest living historian, best known for his ability to expand his writings about military history beyond the facts and figures and into an examination of the sociological significance of war. A decorated veteran of the British Army, Howard was awarded the nation's military cross for distinguished service as an infantry officer with the Coldstream Guards during the Italian campaign of World War II. Following the war, he completed his education at the University of Oxford and began a career as a historian and professor in the late 1940s. As an educator, Howard has held professorships with All Souls College, the University of Oxford, where he served as Regis Professor of Modern History from 1980 to 1989, Yale University, and King's College London, where he was credited with founding the Department of War Studies in 1962. As an author, Howard has produced or contributed to important writings on subjects ranging from war and European history to World War I and II and the Franco-Prussian War, which is the title of his most famous work. He is also an editor and translator of the most widely read version of Karl von Clausewitz's masterpiece, On War. Sir Max Hastings is an award-winning author, journalist, and broadcaster whose work has appeared in every British national newspaper and who now writes regularly for the Daily Mail and the Financial Times. Winner of the 2012 Pritzker Literature Award for a Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing, Hastings is author of more than 20 books on military history and affairs, including Inferno, The World at War, 1939 to 1945, Catastrophe 1914, Europe Goes to War, and most recently, The Secret War, Spies, Ciphers, and Guerrillas, an exploration of espionage during World War II. And now, Sirs Michael Howard and Max Hastings. Hi. I'm Max Hastings, and it's a huge honor for me to be here today to interview Sir Michael Elliot Howard, a recipient of the 2015 Pritzker Military Museum and Library's Founders Literature Award. Sir Michael was selected by the Museum and Library's founder, Colonel Jennifer N. Pritzker, to receive this award for his immense contribution to furthering the public understanding of military history and military affairs. Sir Michael, warmest congratulations. Now, you've got an enormous number of letters after your name, and I think for an American audience, we ought to start by explaining how some of them came about. Now, first of all, there's MC. Now, that's Military Cross, one with the Coldstream Guards in Italy during the war? That's right. Um, I was uh, with the unit that landed at Salerno, at the bottom of Italy, and I stayed with them until we got up to the top to Trieste. And, uh, I got my military cross through the most old-fashioned way possible, that is leading a bayonet charge. I think I was probably the last person who did that. It was certainly the last time I was ever going to do it. If you're going to be brave, you've got to do it when you're very young. And once you've done it, be very careful after that to survive so that people will be around to congratulate you afterward. Yes, I remember you hearing you once say that when you're 20, it's amazing how stupid you can be to win a military exactly, cross. Yes. Now, your next set of initials are CH, which means Companion of Honour, which is a British state honour, which is given to a pretty limited number of very successful um, high functionaries in Britain. Well, I think I, I, I got it from my work as a historian, basically, because it does go, as you quite rightly say, to a rather small number of people. Quite often they are senior, very distinguished politicians who can't get peerages for some reason or another. But there are also a number of other people who've got it through sheer hard work at their own job. But the last one is the most distinguished of all that the Queen has in her personal gift the Order of Merit, um, 24 members, and you are one of those 24. 
And I think everybody realizes this means you were recognized as the foremost academic and certainly the foremost historian in Britain. Well, it is not for me to comment upon the Queen's choice. I am, I need to hardly say, overwhelmed to find myself in that kind of distinguished company. People like the musician Simon Rattle, the uh, architect Norman Foster, <coughs> um, the uh, great um, uh, museum uh, uh, d d director Neil McGregor. I could go on, but there are only 24 of us. And this is a great honor to be a part of it. Now, your career really started in the Second World War. You were a student at Oxford yes. uh, when it started. And I think you could have become a musician <coughs> rather than a fighting soldier. I was a quite accomplished oboist, uh, and I was approached by the Royal Air Force, which for some reason was recruiting a number of musicians to boost its morale, I suppose, to join as a trainee oboist. And I thought this was a brilliant idea, I'd be able to go on being a musician throughout the war. And I consulted my professor. Uh, who was a wise old bird who puffed at his pipe and who looked at me and had a bad stammer. He said, yes, Howard, uh, I can see the attraction of that. But after the war, when they asked what we were doing during the war, uh, I was playing the oboe for the Royal Air Force. Uh, I didn't have to go any further than that. I joined the army instead. So your time in the Coldstream Guards in Italy, it obviously had a tremendous effect on you was how could it not? Um, how did it affect you in your life, would you say, those years with the Coldstream Guards? Well, it made me interested in war apart from anything else. It gave me all kinds of experiences which I wouldn't have had otherwise, some pleasant, some unpleasant. But it did mean that when I went back to civilian life to do what I had always wanted to do, which was to be a professional historian, I was much more interested in war than I ever thought I would have been before. And because I had already started writing a little regimental history of one kind or another, uh, I was given the job at King's College London of being a lecturer in military studies. And I started, as I say, not from war, but from history in general. And when I was asked whether I would become a military historian. I said, yes, so long as I am regarded as a historian of war rather than as an operational military historian. Because one of the things I find most interesting about war is the war way in which wars have been shaped by the societies that fight them and the way in which the societies which fight them determine what kind the war is going to be. So, although I have enormous respect for operational historians... Right about which divisions went which well, way yes, and all and that right sort of thing. Right basically mm. about, uh, uh, about battles and things. They've done wonderful work and very interesting indeed, but they've got to be set in the context, not only of the wars which they are fighting, but of the societies and the cultures that are fighting them. And that made it for me a far more interesting topic than if I had simply devoted myself to military history as such. Now, in your early years, you, you travelled quite a lot in the United States, and um, you'd always had very close connections with the United States. I think this had a terrific formative influence on you. Oh, indeed. Well, I think that anybody who's visited the United States is changed by their experience of being in touch with this great, strange society out there. But I travelled then, in the early, uh, early years of the Cold War, as it was, because I was one of the very few people at that time in England who was trying to understand the nature of nuclear weapons and the difference which nuclear weapons is going to make not only to the conduct of war, but to the conduct of international relations. And as a result, I got invited to a number of seminars and conferences, which were attended by all the great men of that time, by Henry Kissinger, Tom Schelling, um, Albert Wallstetter, the founders, as it were, of thinking about nuclear war. And that 
molded my, my, my thinking, sometimes agreeing with them, sometimes disagreeing with them, but being at the center of what seemed to me the most important debate which was going on in the world at that time. Well, one of the things that's always made you um, so unusual is that you're not only a hugely distinguished historian writing about the past, but you've always been hugely engaged with military affairs of the present and what's going on in the, in the world today. And that was true back in the 1950s. And of course, you were one of the founders of what's today, I suppose, the world's foremost strategic think tank, the International Institute of Strategic Studies. How did you, what, what made you decide to, that we needed an, an Institute of Strategic Studies? Well, it, I, I, I was one of, <coughs> a number of people who, when the debate about nuclear weapons started, with whether we should have them or not, how they should be used, there seemed to be nobody who knew anything about this except um, a very small number of people in Whitehall who did know all about it, and a certain number of retired service people who may or may not have known anything about it but wanted to learn. And so we reckoned that we would create an institute rather along the lines of the um, uh, Council for Foreign Relations in, 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 in New York, or Chatham House in England, whose job, they saw their job as to educate the public as far as one could on the facts of the problems of the, of, of, of the whole question. And that was what the, 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 the ISS started as being. It's now expanded itself enormously and wonderfully. But it did start by studying the problem of nuclear weapons, and that is why its uh, periodical still is called Survival. That was, we were in the business of seeing how survival could be ensured in a nuclear age. Now, while nobody could ever have called you um, an ardent cold warrior in the sense that you were never a hawk, at the same time, I would have thought that all your life you've been amazingly clear-sighted about the Soviet Union and the threat it presented. I don't think you were ever in any doubt about which side you were on at a time when so much of the academic world on both sides, the Atlantic, did incline to the left. Um, I had no doubt about which side I was on. I mean, I found myself, that was my lot, uh, um, the West. Uh, I am part of the West. My thinking is molded by the West. But I'm also sufficiently a member of the West, I think, to understand what the Soviet Union was on about, what communism was all about, and to try put, to put the threat in its context, to realize that one was dealing not simply with the Soviets, but with Russians. And in order to deal with them, we understand what it was like to be a Russian, who still do, that their background is different from ours, our history is different from ours, their threat perception is different from their, ours. And one has got to understand why they think the way they do, understand why they think the way they do. I never forgot do. about 25 years ago, I was doing a television interview with you, uh, not unlike this one, and I said, are we doomed forever to have the Russians as our enemies? And you were inclined to think that we were because you said they will always resent our success and their failure. Well, I think that that is probably the case, that <coughs> being situated where they are, uh, in the middle of a huge great plain. They are very conscious of threat both from the East and from the West. Well, we won't talk about the, the, the problem of signing Soviet relations. But the history of Russia's relations with Europe have always been of their seeing the threat coming from, from Europe, uh, extending their frontiers as far as they can to be safe. And on the other hand, the Europeans seeing the Russians as being a threat, going right back to the days of Ivan the Terrible and elsewhere, and trying to push them back as far as possible. It has been going on for 300 years, it is going on today. Now the books that made your reputation in the 1950s, um, the Franco-Prussian War, I suppose the history of the Franco-Prussian yes. War, was the book that to this day everybody associates with you yes. and says this was uh, one of your masterpieces. Um, how did you get into that? What made you decide to write that book? Well, um, the first thing that struck me when I started studying the history of war in general was a transformation that occurred in Europe between war in, in 1815 with the Battle of Waterloo and war in 1916, the Battle of the Somme. 
What was it that transformed the whole nature of war in such a catastrophic fashion? And I therefore looked at the development of warfare in Europe and saw that this tipping point was the wars of German unification, the 18, especially 1870-71, whereby when the Prussians defeated the, the French unifi unified Germany. Now, in fact, a far more important war, globally speaking, of course, was, was the American Civil War. And people ask, often wonder why it was that the Europeans had learned so little from the experience of the American Civil War. And the short answer was that shortly after the American Civil War, there was the Franco-Prussian War. And the Franco-Prussian War was far more um, influential, far more relevant to what the Europeans were doing, fought on the same battlefields they were going to be fought, with very much the same kind of weapons. And so, in 1914, when people began to, play, began to fight, or just before, to plan for the, for, the, for, the, for the coming war, it was to 1870 that they looked back, that sudden catastrophic transformation which occurred with the Prussian victory. How did that happen? And what, if, what, what was the influence of that victory on the thinking in Europe and elsewhere, which led to the wars of the 20th century. Now, you wrote a very important volume of the British strategic history of the Second World War, um, in which I think you were one of the first to make plain that although Churchill and Roosevelt created this wonderful rhetoric about the Grand Alliance, uh, that indeed, in truth, the relations between the United States and the Soviet Union and Britain during the Second World War were far, far more difficult than uh, all that wonderful Churchillian rhetoric suggested. Well, you're kind to attribute it uh, to, to my volume. In fact, I think that particular um, illusion had been shattered long before my book appeared, which was in, in the early 1970s. But certainly the further one did get into the documents and studied the exchange of views which took place, uh, which, were form which, which formed the actual strategy strategy, the grand strategy in, in Europe and elsewhere, how far apart the Americans on the one hand and the British on the other were at the beginning. And what an enormously difficult job it was for them to get together, to argue, to sort things out and eventually end up with a common and agreed strategy. Well, no, it was never an agreed strategy. That practically every new, every, every new initiative had to be fought through and discussed, not always with very good will, one must say, um, but basically with the Americans who at the very beginning said the way to defeat the Germans is to, in one great battle, which has got to be fought on the, on, 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 in, in northwest Europe, that means that we've got to get over to Britain, we've got to invade in Normandy, and then there will be the great Armageddon which will destroy everything. Well, the British, for a number of reasons, thought that this was rather oversimplifying the issue. Apart from anything else, we were already fighting the Mediterranean and various other places. With, apart from anything else, um, we had, first of all, to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, we then had to destroy the German capacity to prevent us from landing, which meant acquiring command of the air. Uh, it, it meant making use of the, of, of the armies which we already had in the Mediterranean, so-called Mediterranean strategy. And so, bit by bit, the thing was put together with a great deal of um, misunderstanding on both sides and a great many terrible mistakes which were made on both sides. But it was therefore a far more interesting uh, involved business, the making of Allied strategy, than the, as you're quite right to say, the rather romantic view about the special relationship um, indicated. But another part of, to me, your clear-sightedness is even at the moments uh, in post-war history, when the United States has, has been least loved in the world, let's say after Vietnam, I remember you saying to me again, a good many years ago now, we should never forget that whatever the United States gets wrong, the United States is the only nation that can get anything done in the world. And I think you still feel that's true today, don't you? I'm afraid not as has changed, except one thing, which is the American attitude to this, that there was, um, uh, during the Cold War, an American not only determination to put things right in the world, but a belief that they could. Now, since then, a lot of 
unfortunate uh, things have happened rather to disillusion both the United States about its capacity to do so and that also of, 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 its, uh, of its allies also. The uh, realization that um, the world is a far more complicated place, that American power on its own can achieve far less than it was believed. The experience of Vietnam uh, was the first shattered, shattering revelation of this. The experience in Afghan, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, another one. So the United States is understandably, and I think rightly, much more cautious about what it can really do with its enormous power. And the rest of the world is far more mistrustful of what the United States does with that power when it uses it. But nonetheless, this fact does still remain that the United States is the only country with the economic, the military and the soft power to really achieve global results. I was very surprised when you said to me a few weeks ago that you felt the world was in a worse mess today than for a very long time you can remember. And I uh, tried to dispute that with you. I said, is it maybe that as one gets older is that uh, you take a gloomier view that in the end, if you look at where the world is now compared with, let's say, 1914 or whatever, surely it's not that bad. When one looks at these threats today with your extraordinary reach, do we feel, I mean, Putin is not Stalin, um, ISIS is, is not Hitler, I don't know. How should we see the threats that the world is facing today in the great perspective of history? Max, I doubt whether there has been anybody in their 90s, as I am, who has not believed that the world is going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> Uh, so I do accept that there is a certain sort of pers personal attitude to, to, to all this. But I would say not so much that the world uh, is in a, in, in a worse mess or a better mess. It's in a different kind of a mess. As you quite right to say, Putin is not Stalin. Russia is not the Soviet Union. But they nonetheless present a different kind of problem, a far less significant problem than, Soviet, uh, than Stalin the Soviets. But nonetheless, the nearer you get to the Soviet, to, to Russia, I'm sorry, I mustn't refer to the Soviet Union, the more you realize that there's, there's this continuing um, uh, problem about Russia and Russia, Russian power. Putin uh, is... Uh, comparable to, and he would love me for saying this, to the great Tsars of the 16th and 17th century. He emphasizes for the Russians something they need, need very much to have, a sense of self-confidence, a sense of the superiority of their culture to others. And suff they suffer from a considerable inferiority complex, which Putin is doing his damnedest to put right. So uh, all th the business of putting it right does present problems of security to its neighbors. That is a different kind of problem to that which Stalin and the rest just presented. It's not an existential threat to us. It is not an existential threat in the terms in which a nuclear-armed Soviet Union was. But never forget, they still have nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose you can say that any country which has nuclear weapons can present an existential threat to its rivals. I can't help thinking that we shall never live comfortably with the Russians until they achieve some degree of economic success, until they've got something to, to take pride in themselves other than oil, gas and fear. Well, the Russians have so much to be proud of. Um, the communists, um, and Stalin in particular, had a great deal to be proud of in the way in which they did build up in between the wars. They, they, they took a defeated, uh, uh, backward country and they, they turned it into one of the leading industrial powers in the world at terrible cost, at the cost of millions of lives of starvation, but they did it. And with that, they were then able both to resist and ultimately to destroy the German Nazi power and never forget that it was the Russians who destroyed the German army. Help from us, uh, the, the Americans and the British, but it was the, it, it was the Red Army which tore the tripes out of the Germans. So that was something to be proud of. In the 1950s, they produced nuclear weapons in a way to terrify the, 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 the Americans and the rest of us. And then suddenly the whole thing collapsed. 
Overnight, almost, it collapsed. This great achievement, nothing left of it at all. And now Putin and his, his, his colleagues are trying to pull the thing up, put it, put it together in some way. So, not an existential threat, no, but still a problem. What about ISIS? How should we view ISIS and the great scheme of the world? I see ISIS as a disease of the Enlightenment. That is to say, it is a reaction against everything which has been achieved by the Enlightenment, by which I do mean our scientific, industrial, democratic societies. Um, because we have produced, um, uh, how can I put it, societies which are immensely successful in producing peace, tranquility and order. Within societies which represent peace, tranquility and order, a lot of people get very bored. They want excitement. They go out looking for excitement. If it isn't at home, they will go, go and find it elsewhere. That's one thing. The other thing is that the enormous mixture of populations now is making it very much more difficult to create cohesive societies um, out of all the hundreds and thousands, millions of people who are moving around the world. Now, the great achievement of the, of, of the United States is it did take in immigrants from all over the world and turn them into Americans. It's amazing how successful you have been at, 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 at doing that and are continuing to do it. But one of your most brilliant observations, it seemed to me, in a 2007 lecture you gave about, at Oxford about Islamic fundamentalism, is you said it's a great delusion to believe that we all share a common enthusiasm for freedom. Well, I know. Uh, but if I could just continue a little about what I was saying first. What the Americans have achieved, the British have failed to achieve notably, and nobody else is, is much good at it. That is to say there are large numbers, not sim simply of Islamists as elsewhere, of people in our societies who cannot fit in, who feel that they are, that they are rejected, and react against it. Uh, now, um, I think it was President, Pre President um, George W. Bush who at one moment said he believed fundamentally that in every person's heart there was a burning desire for freedom. Absolute nonsense. In everybody's heart there is a burning desire to belong to a group, to belong to a gang, to belong to a tribe. For heaven's sake, President Bush belonged to the Skull and Bones League Club at, at Yale. Those who didn't belong to it felt rather rejected. I was at Yale myself, and I know. But seriously, um, the first desire when one goes to a school is to fit into a gang, fit into a group. And those who don't fit in feel rejected and bitter. And this rejection and bitterness feeds in, and this on a large scale, with these immigrant groups uh, who just uh, feel left out. And where do they look to? They look to those who are promising uh, a, a group which they will fit into, where they will feel wanted, uh, and where uh, they will get adventure. And where, if you are that way inclined, you're going to be able to kill people. Uh, so. That's what I meant when I said that ISIS is a disease of Western civilization. It's a distortion, it's a reaction against it. Existential threat now. It's a, it's a long-term disease which is very difficult to cure, which we may just have to live with indefinitely. So when people promise victory over ISIS, they're not going to get it. What you may get is stabilizing the thing, making it acceptable, putting it into remission. How far is a Western military response to ISIS credible? <sighs> I think you'll have to split it up into bits. I mean, on its own, uh, it's obviously to to totally inadequate, and everybody agrees that. We have got to use our economic power and our soft power, particularly our soft power, as well as our military power. The military power is probably credible under limited circumstances when it is able to confront ISIS military power. And that, if it can do that and limit it, uh, probably not destroy it, but keep it under control, keep it limited, then the military power is going to be effective. But basically, it has got to be the soft power, which is going to convince these people they're not getting anywhere, and where they're going to try to get is not worth getting to. Let's go back and talk a little more about 
your career as a historian, that you also, with Peter Perrette, um, translated and edited uh, Clausewitz. Um, should soldiers and historians today still be reading Clausewitz? Is this early 19th century Prussian still got important things to teach us? Well, they should certainly be reading it. They should be buying it because it's a nice little source of income for me. So you're not going to get me saying anything against Clausewitz at all. But yes, they should. Because um, the thing, Clausewitz understood war. He realised it was not a board game of simply one person against others using their intelligence and their wits uh, to, to know how to feed the other one the god. <laughs> the first, I think that the most interesting that Clausewitz said about war, and I think it's the first person who said, is it's bloody dangerous. <laughs> that, in fact, when you get involved in a war, you're liable to get killed. You'll certainly get liable to get badly hurt. And so, uh, the first thing that you've got to have in war is the moral strength to be able to stand up to that. Not simply the dangers, but the uncertainty, the mess which war is. I mean, one of the things which I learned more or less on the, my third day on the landing at Salerno was that the, everything that you plan, nothing you plan is going to work. We got lost. Well, that great line of Tedder's, uh, war is organised confusion, you well, saw that well, at first hand. Exactly. So that was, that was Clausewitz's starting point, that in order, in order to wage war successfully, war is, some, is a moral conflict. Uh, at, um, and therefore, the first thing that you need is somebody, uh, in general, is somebody who can keep their head in all this and think clearly in all this and provide moral strength for the people who is commanding to put up with it all. From that he goes on to develop ideas which are not necessarily um, uh, original about how to, how, to, how to wage battles and how to deploy forces, all that. But that is the fundamental thing which Clausewitz should be read for. And also, sorry, uh, he said war consists of three factors. The armies that are fighting it, the governments that are fighting it, and the peoples behind them who are fighting it. And so to regard it simply as a matter of clash of armies is totally inadequate. The army that the war, he said, is uh, a continuation of state policy by other means. And state policy is determined by the governments. So the governments determine what the kind of war it is going to be, and, so, and the soldiers how to fight it. But more important than any are the people. Uh, in Clausewitz's writing at the beginning of the days of national wars, that uh, Napoleon was so successful because he was able to mobilize the entire French people behind him to form these huge armies uh, motivated by a desire for glory, which simply overran the traditional armies of the, of, of the 16th century. And once you do get the force of people, the moral strength, the enthusiasm, the fanaticism, of people, then war does become something very different. Now, all through the Cold War years, you were an unswerving supporter of a very strong NATO posture um, uh, in the confrontation with the yeah. Soviet Union. Um, but now, today, are we living in a new world? What we're seeing happening on both sides of the Atlantic, we're seeing a, a very sharp reduction of conventional forces. How worried should we be about the reductions in the US Army, about the reductions in the British Army and conventional armed forces? Is the world changing in such a way that we need completely different defence responses? Well, certainly wars are no longer won uh, or will be fought by large armed forces. But if you do reduce them below a certain level, they can't function at all. And that is what worries me a great deal about what we're doing in my own country in England at the moment. That we're ce ceasing to provide the kind of armed forces which will enable the United States to regard us as heavy, worth having as allies at all. But do we think that the nature of, of war is changing fundamentally? And you were saying the other day that in some respects you found uh, the threat of cyber warfare um, almost more alarming uh, than a nuclear war, because everybody knows that nuclear weapons are things you can't use, whereas cyber warfare is something it can, but you all put it much better than I have. Well, 
Certainly the nature of war has changed, it is always changing. When a war is no longer going to be fought by the great armies, which it was in the 20th century. If I were a new state starting out uh, without any army or armed forces at all, <coughs> not very much money, I go for three things. I go for spooks, geeks and thugs. Go on. I would have the spooks are the most important of all. Intelligence. The best, in I would set out to have the best intelligence in the world. Geeks. People who know about cyber war apart from anything else. The importance of cyber war cannot be overestimated. Um, it, um, I, it's hard to see what its limits are going to be. But it should not be impossible within a very short time, if it is not already, for some young man uh, typing away in a back bedroom in a, a little, little back town in Virginia or somewhere to bring the entire infrastructure of a large town uh, crashing down. Uh, now, a state which has that capacity doesn't need nuclear weapons. It can paralyze its, its, its adversaries. It could simply pull the plug on them as it were for, and keep it plugged for a matter of days or weeks, and then plug in again perhaps, by which time the place would be at its mercy. No need for nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are a waste of space. So you need pretty good geeks. You also need, I call thugs, which is unfortunately a waste, I always say special forces, experts in uh, what I think the American, American Army calls kinetic activities that I call killing. Uh, capacity to get at whoever they want to <coughs> and kill them. Uh, not necessarily very large numbers, but selectively. Uh, now, um, in order to get the thugs, they've got to be well trained, they've got to be highly intelligent. For that you really do need an army to produce them from. But never mind. Uh, that would be my minimum requirement. What about drones? Do you have a moral problem with drones? I have drones? no problem, not a moral problem with drones at all. <coughs> this is a continuation of a sort of taboo which started way back in the Middle Ages when a pope excommunicated archers uh, because they were able to kill people from a distance rather like real men fighting them hand to hand. Uh, the same thing occurred rather more recently at the end of the 19th and 20th century when artillery, which pre previously had always had to be fighting and firing within sight of the enemy, developed the capacity of the range for indirect fire. But it was regarded by real artillerymen that it was unfair to do that and, and, and that you always had to have your, 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 your artillery up, up with the infantry to give the inf infantry courage. Now, exactly, there was this prejudice against being safe while you're killing other people. I see no moral objection whatever to being safe if you're going to kill other people. I mean, the moral objection is how you kill them, where you kill them, why you kill them, but not whether you are safe or not whether you'll do it. But especially in the United States, following Edward Snowden's uh, defection to Moscow right. and his very public proclamation yes. about the state of surveillance, uh, a substantial number of libertarians in the United States feel that Snowden has revealed uh, the United States government engaged in a level of electronic surveillance that is unacceptable in a free society. What was your own attitude? I think there is a real moral problem here. I think that the government has not only the right but the duty to gather as much intelligence as it can from whatever source it gets it and to keep it, keep it private to itself uh, in order to be able to function effectively at all. I think on the other hand there is a civic duty that as many people as possible, if not indeed everybody, should have access to material which is going actually to affect their own livelihood, lifestyle or, or existence. There is, I think, absolutely no single um, definitive argument on one side or the other that has simply got as it were to be fought out. Polit it's a political problem. It's got to be sold or, 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 or somehow made, 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 made livable with 
by, by, by ongoing politics and discussion. But it seems to me that it's almost impossible in this age of the terrorist threat from within. One can't imagine, other than by bulk surveillance of electronic data, that the security services have any chance at all of keeping tabs on a lot of these people who want to do us harm. I, abs I absolutely agree. Um, the the, the, the uh, left left wing uh, writers talk about the security state dismissively. All states are security states. Security is what the state exists to provide. So again, I have no problem there. How should we view China? that is this going to be the existential threat of the middle, middle years of the 21st century? Uh, not or? an existential threat, existential threat, no. A major problem in international relations to be managed. It is, uh, people quite often use the analogy of Germany and Britain in the 19th century with China and, and, and the United States. There was Britain, a dominant global power, uh, maintaining its values, spreading them where, wherever possible, but above all, it was dependent upon our naval power particularly to do this. Creeping up on us were the Germans, uh, and the Germans were seen by us as a threat. The Germans saw the uh, development of their power and capacity to do it as the natural right of any growing state, like the United States indeed. Now, the question is whether the relationship between the United States and China is going to be that between Britain and Germany at the end of the 19th century, or is it going to be that between Britain and the United States in the early part of the 20th century, where the British realized that the United States are going to become effectively and quite properly a power in their own right, and we've got to get along with it. Um, now, I don't think there will likely to be a special relationship uh, between China and the United States, but there could be and should be, and I hope will be, a civilized understanding and adjustment of, of, of power to power. Um, I think we are now in the realm of old-fashioned Henry Kissinger power politics. Uh, uh, power rivalries do not necessarily end in war. Uh, they can always be managed, and I see no reason whatever why Chinese and, and, and American relations should be, be managed. There will be frictions, there will be <coughs> nasty little encounters, but with goodwill and understanding on both sides, then I think that perfectly possible, and certainly no existential threat. It's quite scary how assertive militarily, or rather naval terms, the Chinese were starting to be in the South China Sea and the East China Sea and so on, that um, one's always worried that as they become more capable, yes. uh, their, their armed forces, that they miscalculate. Oh, they may, exactly. And the Americans may miscalculate as well. As I said, it does need wisdom, good intelligence, mutual understanding to be able to avoid miscalculations, or if they occur, to limit the, li limit the danger they've done. Now, in the course of your very long life, um, and having been a player on the strategic scene for, goodness, about um, 60, 70 years yourself, that you met uh, some of the great figures uh, of the 20th and early 21st century, that who are the ones, um, I mean, I know about your relationship with Henry Kissinger and so on, but who are the, uh, are the great men, great women who made the, the, the most impact on you over all these years? I'm afraid, although I've pressed the flesh with a certain number at receptions and things, I haven't got to know any of them really well. Um, who are the ones that I have impressed you I most? I think though? the one who impressed me most was Dean Acheson, uh, who came to a couple of conferences in, 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 in Britain at, uh, uh, discussing Anglo-American relations in, in his, his later years. And I was impressed by his splendid man, the power, uh, power of his personality, the uh, width of his knowledge, his wit, uh, a formidable person. Uh, I think probably the most formidable the, and, and the most impressive and the most attractive the, 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 that I have met. I remember when I was saying some of those things and praising Dean Ashton's extraordinary yes. role in the Korean crisis yes. in 1950 and so on. 
And uh, an American diplomat said to me, remember, Max, that Dean Ashton never achieved any elective office in the United States, despite repeatedly trying. Well, well, I think that that may be a reflection on the United States electorate rather than on Atchison, I'm afraid. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, I got to know rather better, formidable woman. Uh, um, and, um, Say a bit more about Thatcher. Well, and uh, well, I'll tell. You, I have so many Thatcher stories. Go on. The the the, uh, the, 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 the one which I remember particularly was when I was invited to a dinner party, together with my colleague, former tutor, the great historian Hugh Trevor Roper, who was then, for reasons of himself, uh, known as uh, the Lord Dacre. It's the kind of thing which happens in England, it hasn't happened to me yet. Um, uh, and uh, the lady was in a furious temper. The other members of the, of the, of the, of the, of the party were all rather senior officials uh, who were also very overworked, very unhappy. And uh, the, the Prime Minister started to make conversations where to go round the table, one after another, and said, well, Sir Edward, when are we going to get some good news from the Home Office? And then the poor man would stutter and go round one after another, beating them down. She came to Hugh Trevor Roper, who was sitting opposite her, and said, Well, Lord Dacre, when are we going to get another book from you? Uh, to which Hugh replied, Well, Prime Minister, there's one on the stocks, one on the stocks, on the stocks! On the stocks, is in the shops, that's where we want to have them. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at her and I thought, thank God that we have a constitution which will prevent her from doing what she really wants to do, which is take us all out and have a shot on the spot. <laughs> but you admired her enormously, I think. I admired her enormously, mm. I did. I really did, yeah. Who were the historians who have impressed you most um, um, over your life? <sighs> Influenced you most, perhaps? Influenced? Actually, um, this is so difficult, you know, because, um, because there's, there are so many, they're, they're all, all so mixed up. Uh, actually, the one I think who I've learnt most from was not a historian at all, but a sociologist, the German Max Weber, with his understanding of the way in which societies have developed and what does hold them together. Um, Jakob Burkhardt that Swiss historian who wrote a lot, a lot about history and at the end of it said uh, uh, ultimately, remember the whole point of history is not to make you clever for next time, it's to make you wise forever. And I frankly think that uh, you can't be very wise if you don't know any history, though knowing a lot, knowing a lot of history does not necessarily make you wise. Um, Forgive me, I can't go, go, go into further details. And yet one, <coughs> we're living in an age when people seem to know less and less history. They know little I bits know. of history about, they might know about the Holocaust and actually quite a lot about the Second World War. But history in general, um, there seem to be fewer and fewer people, especially politicians, who know any history at all. Well, they, they know less and less about the Holocaust because they all, the, the professional historians will specialise on some little detail about the Holocaust, about the gas which was used, about the nature of the railway trains which drew them there, and make their reputation by writing a thesis about that. Now the trouble is that uh, within the academic world now, you can only get on by, as a, as a young person, writing a thesis. And theses, by in their nature, have really got to be on a rather small subject. So they grow up uh, and achieve eminence in, in, in their field through knowing a great deal about a very little. And they, I'm afraid, drag other, other, other people to do the same. Most of the broad histories now, broad readable histories, tend to be written not necessarily by professional historians at all, but by intelligent journalists, if I may say, <laughs> like Max Hastings. <laughs> that you were a um, Regis Professor of History at Oxford, which um, ma made you, it, it was a job that um, made you one of the most senior historians, if not the most senior in Britain. Yeah. Uh, and I remember hearing you say once that anybody who was going to have that sort of title at a great university ought to be capable about 
talking about history in the round, yes. and that was, I think, part of your deploring this over-specialisation yes. business. Yes, yep, it was. Well, I still think that that is the case, but um, I'm not sure that uh, all my successes have actually lived up to that. What is history going to make of the wars of our own time, of Iraq and Afghanistan, that we perceive them today as defeats and, in some degree, humiliations for Western military power? Um, and we look at uh, the mess that the whole of the Middle East is in. Uh, how do you think in 50 years people are going to look back on, on these engagements? Right. Max, the only wise thing that I've ever said, or the wisest thing I've ever said, is there's no such thing as history. History is what historians write. And historians will write what interests them specifically. Um, so. There's no, not going to be a verdict of history on these things, but many historians will read into them what, they, what they want to read into them. All I can say is what I would read into them, <laughs> is that um, the, with the growing involvement of peoples in war, war is no longer fought by small, small armies. The importance of understanding the society that you're fighting, uh, what you're up against, it becomes absolutely overwhelming. That's where intelligence, understanding, and history do, do, does come in. Because ultimately, what is, again, Clausewitz in conclusion, what one is fighting for is not victory. What you're fighting for is a stable peace to, which you can live with. Uh, and therefore, when people talk about victory over, victory over ISIS or anything else, it makes no sense. What you're, going, you're never going to get victory over ISIS. You've got to learn to live with it. Victory may, as, as victory in, 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 in um, 1815 did, at the end of the, 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 the Great the Europe, uh, the Waterloo, mm -hmm. that produced a stable society that lasted for the best part of 100 years, thanks to the wisdom and understanding of the people who saved it. The, the First World War ended in 1918 with a crushing victory and a catastrophically unstable society. And so the un to understand your enemy, understand what you're fighting about and realize that the end process is a better peace uh, rather than the victory is only a way to this. But what we seem to have found in Iraq and Afghanistan is that the soldiers can win all the firefights yes. and yet it means nothing because I haven't forgotten a very distinguished American soldier, um, H.R. McMaster, um, saying after talking to me one day about what his armoured cavalry regiment had been achieving in Iraq and he said the trouble is there was nothing to join up to and I'd have thought yes, isn't yes. it the problem for the West yes. in these engagements that yes. finding anything to join up to? Well th that that is so uh, but also yeah the, 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 you've got to be a political context which is what, what, what he re re really was saying that your um, your victory is going to produce a situation and you can see the situation you're trying to produce and you will fight or you'll conduct your armed forces in order to get to that particular situation which is going to be a, a stable peace stable because the bad guys have been destroyed and and everybody is now <coughs> cooperating on creating peace to create to or or at least the bad guys have learned not to be bad guys any longer. All that has got to be borne in mind during the course of fighting. Uh, are we fighting this war in such a way that we are going to produce a better peace? Um, the great, well, the the the, the uh, great uh, Christian theologian Saint Augustine, who wrote, who really founded the whole idea of of, of a just war made the point that a, 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 a war is just if it produces a better peace after it. And I think one can say that the Second World War was a just war, uh, not simply because all the baddies seemed to be on one side and the other, but because we were able after it to create a stable society. Uh, the First World War, although fought with a profound sense of justice on both sides, ended up as a profoundly unjust war because it created a worse situation than being produced before. Now, you just mentioned St. Augustine, and you yourself have been a practicing Christian all your life, 
and you were certainly in the 1950s and 60s a prominent member of some Christian um, academic organisations. Yes, that sure. how far has, has that yes. been a part of, of how important a part of your life and, and how, where did it fit into the rest of your life, your Christian belief? As far as this is, is, is concerned, so far as being a historian or a student of war, it fits in because A, having been brought up as a Christian, I have got a Christian sense of morality and the Christian and the sense of, of morality has got to brought, be brought into, be in, 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 into action when you are asking, is this a just war? Is this, am I entitled to be killing people to do this? And if it is a just war, what? What killing is legal and what is not legal? I think that everybody in the West, not so much because we're Christians, because a lot of us aren't, but because we're children of the Enlightenment, do have this profound moral sense one should not kill people. Uh, and the situations under which one is entitled to kill people, which is in order to produce a, 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 a better peace, must be really thought, thought about and internalized. Uh, and the Christian Church, one of the major problems it has always been wrestling with has been precisely this, what is a just war, the Christian just, doctrine of a just war, which has, I think, been taken over and absorbed into a contemporary United Nations and other things, where they don't refer to Christianity for it, but it is, the Christianity is there in their guts. Uh, <coughs> so, to that extent, yes, I, I, I think my... Christian beliefs have permeated into my thinking about war. Is the West now engaged in what is going to become a historic confrontation with Islam? Well, it is a renewal, in a way, of a historic confrontation. For a thousand years, from the 7th until the 17th centuries, Christian, Chris, Christendom and Islam were fighting a continuous uninter uninterrupted war virtually in the Mediterranean and in Southeast Europe, one which overlapped into Spain because at the turn, in, 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 at, the, um, in, at, at the beginning of, of the, the, the second millennium, the, the thousand or so, uh, Islam was actually dominating the Mediterranean, dominating the Middle East, and looked as if it was going to dominate Europe, uh, and reached its climax in the 16th and 17th centuries and then slowly ebbed and Christendom and the Enlightenment won and is, is Islam became, apparently to everybody, a, a historical curiosity. One went to mosques, mosques and thought of how absurd, that nobody can really believe it's nonsense. And however, Isla, Islam is now coming back as a serious world, not only as a serious world religion, which it always has been, but as in certain elements of Islam at least, a confrontation, a sense of war um, with, 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 with Christendom and, and, and with the West. That, that the uh, traditional Islamic idea that Islam is a land of peace, that is the land of war against who wage a jihad. And we're seeing the revival of the whole jihad concept, which was endemic in, 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 in Islamic civilization for a thousand years. And yet it's very hard for most of us in the West to um, grasp this, to come to terms with it, because uh, militant Islam seems to have nothing at all to offer any citizen of the 21st century. It seems an entirely brutalistic concept. Well, exactly. <laughs> I think that, 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 that is entirely the trouble, and that is why I think that the West will ultimately <coughs> win, because, yes, uh, in fact, Islam is divided between those who do actually accept, not Christian doctrine, but nonetheless the general morality and attitude towards, to, 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 towards life and politics, etc., of the West. Uh, most of them uh, do with or without any trouble. And there is this growing minority who do want jihad. And they want jihad and the, they recruit from all those people that we were talking about earlier who are discontented for one reason or another with what the West has to offer. On the United States in the 21st century that I remember again about 1990, about the end of the Cold War, and I was saying to an American diplomat, it's going to be a remarkable world in which the United States is the only superpower. 
uh, to which he said, well, that depends on whether the United States is willing to exercise the role of yeah. the world's su uh, u unique superpower. But um, I don't know, I still have an abiding belief in the American genius somehow that I feel when people say China's going to overtake the United States, um, America's power to reinvent itself is still very remarkable, I think, isn't it? Oh, I know, I know. I have my, uh, the 50, 60, I suppose, years in which I have been interacting with, with, with American friends, they tend to be oscillating between a sense of immense well-being, power, generosity, saving the world on, on the one hand, and on the other, despair. What has gone wrong with us? Why are we doing things so badly? And so this oscillation, I think, will continue. So much does depend on good leadership and, uh, and, and wise leadership. And um, that depends on elections and American elections to the foreign, I'm afraid, seem a total mystery. Michael, having had the pleasure and privilege of knowing you for about four decades now, that I've known so many brilliant historians and clever people, and yet you mentioned earlier that we talked about wisdom and the wise, and to me, what's always been so extraordinary about you is that you're not only a brilliant historian, but you've also, again and again over so long, um, displayed this quality of wisdom, which is so rare in government, so rare in academic life. And I think in this conversation, which has certainly given me such enormous pleasure, you've demonstrated again that you're a um, supremely wise historian whom it's been a privilege to know and to read over all these years. So thank you so enormously uh, for the pleasure of your company and conversation today, Sir Michael Howard. Max, you do say the sweetest things. Thank you to Sir Michael Howard and Sir Max Hastings for a brilliant discussion, and to Colonel Jennifer N. Pritzker for sponsoring this program. To learn more about the 2015 Founders Literature Award or the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, visit us in person or online at pritzkermilitary.org. Thank you, and please join us next time on Pritzker Military Presents. Pritzker Military Presents is made possible by members of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and its sponsors. The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of the museum and library. If you would like to be a part of our studio audience, become a member, or learn more, visit PritzkerMilitary.org. The preceding program was produced by the Pritzker Military Museum.